Hello and welcome to the Lewis Carroll Society of North America's Spring Spotlight on Collectors. Today, you and I will be taking a tour of some amazing Carolian collections, courtesy of Matt Crandall, Ellie Schaefer Salins, and Alan Tannenbaum. My name is Heather. I have a website and a podcast called Alice is Everywhere, but more importantly, I'm the proud chairwoman of your senior common room curators. That is a group of lovely and capable ladies who bring you these virtual events every single month. In fact, be sure to stay tuned later because I will be telling you what's coming up next on your virtual events calendar. Now we have got something for everyone today. We have teapots, we have Disney, we have all manner of Carolian curiosities. Now that chat function is there for you to talk to each other as usual. The Q&A function is there for you to submit questions for your presenters. And I definitely urge you to do so. I will be chatting with each of them, giving them your questions after each of their presentations. And then they will all come back at the end for a sort of collector's round table. All right, enough of my yammering. Let's get to our first collector, Matt Crandall has been collecting strictly Disney Alice in Wonderland for 32 years. He has been featured on the supplemental disc of the Disney Alice in Wonderland Blu-ray and DVD sets since 2010. He mounted an exhibition in 2016 at Jeppy's Entertainment Museum and spoke at the Disney on a convention that same year. In 2018, he contributed the majority of the items in the Disney section of the now touring Wonderland exhibition by the Australian Center for the Moving Image. He lives in Northern Virginia with his wife, Wendy, who has spoken at previous LCSNA events and is a collector in her own right. Their daughter, Haley, has presented several academic papers on Alice at LCSNA and academic conferences as a part of her graduate studies. Now, I believe we are joining Matt in progress. He's already taken just a few steps down the virtual rabbit hole. Matt, See, Matt, are you down there? By the Cheshire Cat's trap door into, into the Queen of Hearts area. We have a very large mural painted on this wall, courtesy of Wendy and a few of her friends, uh, one of whom is Stacia. Uh, some of you may know Stacia. So if you pan over here, this is where my office is, and this is where I sit way too many hours per day. And I'm gonna come up close on all these pieces of art here in a minute, so don't worry about that. Are you seeing what I'm showing? I'm getting a, a message that they're not seeing. I see you over that screen. Okay. I see, I'm seeing everything just fine, Matt. I do recommend everyone to put it on speaker view so that you don't see the little placeholders for the rest of your panelists, but I, I'm seeing your screen just fine, Matt. Okay, so I'm gonna actually start up one level and I'm gonna go off book here for a minute and I'm gonna show you a little bit of non-Disney. So up here on the walls, we have what we call our Oleg wall. So this is Oleg Lipchenko art uh, from his various books. This is from an unused piece from the original Alice in Wonderland book. And then this one, I'm gonna rotate so everybody don't get sick. Um, this is uh, a piece from his most recent Through the Looking Glass book. And then this was a piece from his Kickstarter campaign. He did a series of playing cards. And this is the uh, image of Alice as Queen from the playing card set. All right, so now we're gonna go back down into Wonderland. And as you approach the stairs, you can see we have many icons of, of Wonderland falling down the hole. And all of a sudden I fell. Down, down, down. I'm over here on the wall. We have some art done by our friend Stacia for various um, events in our life. So this is for Wendy's 50th. And this is our daughter when she played the white rabbit in her school play. And now we're gonna start looking at some actual vintage Disney art. Yes, dear? I have, we have Kapim Stacia. She's a 41 year Disney artist. So we're really grateful to have her in our life and contribute you know, to our home. <laughs> okay, so starting here, we have the smallest cell in the world. This is a cell of a rocking horse fly. So it's a little hard to see with the glare. Um, and then up above it is a bigger cell of a rocking horse fly. This is a color model cell of a rocking horse fly so that you can see more clearly the colors and the design of it for the animators instead of having to deal with something this small. So along this wall in the various trees, we have cells of Tolji wood birds. So up here we have a cell 
of the accordion owl. And then we have a birdcage bird. And then this is from a parade float. This is a pencil bird that came from Disneyland. Moving along, we see the caterpillar smoke coming across the ceiling. And then we have a cell of a pencil bird. And then we have a spectacle bird. Sorry about the glare again. Yes. Uh, this is the door to the told you wood, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Here with the Cheshire cat, he glows in the dark when the lights are off. And then we have the mother bird. And then we have horn ducks. So those are all the told you wood cells that we have for birds nesting in the trees. And then if you move over to this wall next to my desk, this is where we enter the land of Mary Blair. So for those of you who don't know, Mary Blair was a concept artist at Disney starting in the late 30s through the mid 50s. And then she came back again in the 60s to do Small World and some things at Disneyland. But she's really well known for her concept art for the 50s Disney films, starting with Song of the South, which is really the 40s, and then ending with Peter Pan. So up here, we have Alice getting ready to run into the Told You Wood. And this is Told You Wood Signs. This is Alice at the Mad Tea Party with uh, the March Hare and the Mad Hatter and a dormouse, he's a little hard to see. Over here, we have Alice and the Cheshire Cat. I'm gonna go sideways again for this one. Up here we have, uh, let's see, I'm trying to get that glare off. This is Alice and the Told You Wood interacting with some interesting denizens. Um, I call this one the hairy eyeballs painting, but it's, there are some strange looking birds with spectacles and big eyes looking at Alice. I'm gonna rotate again. So this is the caterpillar with his hookah. And this is Alice falling down the rabbit hole, looking at herself in the, one of the carnival mirrors. And then moving on across the wall, this is an original attraction poster from Disneyland. Uh, these were posted, this particular variety was posted um, above the ticket, the original ticket booth on top of the mushroom. Um, and these were later found in a fairly large quantity and were sold um, through the Disney gallery above Pirates of the Caribbean. This is a very dark cell and master background setup. So this is an actual cell from movie paired with its actual matching master background from the film. This scene appears um, when the pencil birds have written on the sign that says, don't step on the mom rats, and they run across the, the ground and point to the path. And she's running down the path. And this particular scene is just before she turns the corner where the brush dog is erasing the path. So that happens like two seconds after this. This is a pastel concept that Mary Blair did in preparation for a version of Alice that was going to be done combination live action and animation starring Ginger Rogers that never materialized. And this is Alice in the Bottle on the Sea of Tears, also Mary Blair. This is a cell of the caterpillar. And this is a studio setup of Alice when she's talking to the Caterpillar signed by Walt Disney. This is a preliminary background for um, when Alice falls down the rabbit hole. Um, she's hanging upside down when she lands, her feet are kind of, she lands in this spot when she, when she falls down the hole. This is a concept piece done by Jody Daly of The Pencil Bird. Jody Daly is a contemporary Disney artist. He worked for years at the studio and now he does freelance for the, for the studio. Yes, he did. Um, this is a David Hall painting. Uh, David Hall was an artist who worked at the studio really for only about a year in the thirties. And he did a, hundreds and hundreds of story paintings for Alice in 1939. And this is one of the watercolors that he did. 
That's me in 1971 talking to the Mad Hatter. And I'm wearing really cool pants, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna tilt again. Um, this is the original art for the Little Nipper uh, storybook album from 1951. And this is a commission that I had done by um, Floyd Norman. I'm sure some of you have seen the bizarre Jello commercials that have Alice and the Mock Turtle and the Griffin. And those were actually done by Disney and they were done at the studio in the commercial division. And Floyd Norman was one of the primary animators on that. And this was in about 1957. And they were shown in front of or during the Mickey Mouse Club. And then moving along over here, we have, sorry, I'm gonna rotate again. This is a concept painting for the Mad Hatter Shop at Disneyland by John Hench. And one more, one more rotation. And this is a custom a commission that we had done by Kevin Kidney of Wendy and I as children riding in the Caterpillar car on the Alice attraction at Disneyland. And I think that's it for the walls. I will give you a glance into hell. Yeah, I can show Stacia's pink one. So some of you may know and some of you may not know that we had a, uh, we had a flood here in the house a little bit more than a year ago, we had a pipe burst. And, and that's why I'm only showing you what's in this room because this room is the only one that's been completely restored. The rest of the collection is still in here in hell waiting to be restored from the flood. So the room itself has been restored but the rest of the collection is still awaiting the restoration of the display cases that have, were completely destroyed. So as things go, we will then um, restore the rest of the collection. Now, I forgot to show you one detail of the mural. Uh, Catherine Beaumont came to visit us for Wendy's 50th birthday and she grace, graciously signed our wall in the mural. Wine and begging. Yes, lots of wine and lots of begging. And then we went to Disneyland with her once and that's her in the Caterpillar car with us. And so this is uh, how we have framed that photo. And this was Wendy's childhood record actually. So, and there's Wendy. <laughs> So that is the wall tour. Oh, one more thing, just to, to go off book again. There are a few uh, non-Disney things in here, like, I'm gonna lift this up. Like these are the um, Holmes and Edward store displays for the silverware. Well, that's kind of nice. And then across over here in some of these display cases, these are the Hammersley dishes, and none of these have been reset. And these are some more contemporary tea sets, including this one, which is from the Australian Center of the Moving Images uh, exhibition. They had this teapot commission for that exhibition. And so we brought that back with us from Australia. Okay, now I'm done. Done, done? No, no slideshow, all, all done? You can keep your camera um, on, Matt, for, for audience questions. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. So, well, first of all, I have a question for you. Uh, sure. Just Disney Alice, or are you a big I'm Disney fan otherwise, and do you have any other Disney collectibles? Oh, my gosh. Well, the rest of the room, if you like, I'll turn the video back on. Yes, please. So if I go over here, the rest of this wall, I stop kind of halfway. So here's some <laughs> shag art from Disneyland. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, this is a Jody Daly painting of the submarine ride from Disneyland. And then cells of the mermaids and Wendy, because Wendy's a Wendy, Wendy. So we have some yeah. Peter Pan stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is a concept painting of a mermaid from The Little Mermaid. Oh, wow. And then this is a David Hall of Wendy and a Mary Blair of the London scene with the, with the children flying around. And that's a Haley original down there. <laughs> Adorable. And all our non-Disney books and beer. Oh yeah, and all the, the non-Disney stuff is upstairs in the parlor books and, you know, this more, more standard Carolian fare that's outside the, the Disney realm. Gotcha.
All right, some other audience questions here. And actually, a lot of it isn't really about your collection in general. They just they just want some information from you. They're going to treat you like an encyclopedia here. What is a cell and why is it called a cell? Asked Ricardo. A cell is um, the original art that is used to actually make the animation in an animated movie. And it's called a cell because it's short for celluloid. It's, it's clear. It's... Um, these days it's more like acetate, but back in the early days it was celluloid nitrate, which is where the name cell comes from. It's just the abbreviation for celluloid. Gotcha. And yeah, again, and the, the, oops, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you're muted, Heather. Oops. You have a lot of questions here if you want to turn your camera back on, just so people sure. aren't looking at a dark screen there. <laughs> That'd be lovely. And uh, Charlie Lovett wonders, what influence, if any, did Mary Blair's artwork have on the final 1951 film? Uh, almost entirely. Um, the look of the film was almost completely determined by Mary Blair's styling. Um, and yes, dear, and the color palette. Um, she's making fun of me because when I was on the supplemental, I was very nervous. And um, I was very stony faced the whole time. And the only emotion that appeared in my face was when I said the word palette. And I raised my eyebrows like that when I said palette. Yeah. And uh, she, <laughs> she makes fun of me all the time. But yes, Mary Blair was almost solely responsible for the way the movie looks. Uh, M. Capiello wonders if you had to run into a burning house to preserve one of these items, should you make such a perilous decision, what would you come out with? Assuming your wife and daughter are outside of the house. I ended that. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. That would, that's, that's tough. That's tough. I'd probably take my Wendy. Yeah, Wendy would probably take her Wendy David Hall. And I would probably take, um, I don't know, something from this wall um, over here. Probably, probably the David Hall or maybe one of the Mary Blairs. I, I don't know which one. That My favorite changes all the time. This one's a little too bit big to get out. <laughs> Just practically speaking in this hypothetical scenario. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Wendy Chevrier, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, wonders, oh, you know what? I'm not gonna ask this because I'm gonna save this for the panel discussion, Wendy. I actually had that. I thought everyone could uh, answer that later. Ellie Luchinsky wonders what touched off the Disney obsession. So for a long time, I didn't really know, but then, um, a while back, hang on, let me go back on me here. Um, a while back, probably in the, I don't know, in the third or fourth year of collecting, um, a friend of mine brought me a, an employee newsletter called the Disneyland Line. And in it was this picture of um, uh, the little girl walk around character, Alice. And it triggered a memory of that same day that I showed you with the Mad Hatter. Um, my, my dad was, we spent a whole day at Disneyland just trying to take pictures with the characters. Um, and we were lined up at the street for the parade. And in those days, the parade was just a marching band and the characters. It's not like these really amazing things they do now. And the Alice walk around character came up and talked to me and shook my hand and I'm you know, six. Um, and it made this huge impression on me. Um, so much so that I remember that after the parade ended, we were gonna leave, but um, my dad and his wife wanted to go on the Pirates of the Caribbean. So we rode the ride and I kept tucking my hand under my shirt so that the hand wouldn't get wet because, you know, Alice touched it, so. <laughs> that is adorable. Wow. Okay, that answers that. Okay. Uh, oh, Dana wants to know what was the very first piece that you got, do you remember? The very first piece, I do know what that was. Um, it was um, the four color comic book. I used to work for a comic book distribution company back in LA in the late eighties and early nineties. Um, and so I got access to a lot of really old comic books. And that was the first Alice piece that I got because I was collecting comics back then. The first piece that I bought knowing that I was gonna collect Alice was a drawing, an animation drawing of Alice when she's curtsying, uh, meeting the Queen of Hearts. Um, I got that at a Disney Anna show in um, 19, 89 and March of 1989. And I asked, oh, do you remember? I knew you were going to remember, of course. <laughs> now, Disneyana, is that an annual event when there's not a pandemic? So, so it was, it used to be um, back in the 80s and 90s, there used to be two 
a privately sponsored collector based groups. One was called at the time it was called the National Fantasy Fan Club and now it's called the Disneyana Fan Club. And another one was called the Mouse Club. And so those two groups held shows two, two times a year each. And then in the mid nineties, Disney started holding shows uh, every other year. Um, and then recently when they, Disney created the D23 Collectors Society, they now have big, huge D23 events, kind of like Comic-Con um, every other year when there's no pandemic. Uh, the Mouse Club is gone, but the Disney had a fan club is still going and they have shows two or three times a year now. Excellent. All right, Stephanie, I see your question, but I'm saving it until last because Matt might have to get out of his chair to answer that. So I'm going to put that off till the end. Um, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think she wants to see you to try to show her something specific, but it might be in storage. Oh, okay. to see. Well, actually, I guess you're up, so we'll just ask you. Stephanie asks, Matt, are you able to show the drawings for the Disney World rides that are Alice-based and never used from the original development of the park? Those are it's some of the most unusual and surprising Disney items I remember from when you hosted the LCSNA. I, I can. It will take me a minute or two to get them. So while somebody else is talking, I'll pull them out and we can show them at the end if you like. Oh, that, that would be lovely. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Brian asks, well, first... An opinion, Matt, an awesome collection. I am more envious than you can imagine, but I wonder what your view is of how the Disney film has been so disregarded, even on and off the record by Walt. I'm with you, but tell me why the film is so important to you. And then he has a PS, where'd you get your shirt? Ah, well, let me start with the shirt. <laughs> um, uh, my wife had the shirt made for me. Um, wow. This was fabric um, that I bought from Japan about six or seven years ago. There's a, right when the Burton movies were coming out, both of them, there was a lot of renewed interest in Alice in general. And so a lot of things got made and a lot of fabric got made for people who are doing quilting or homemade projects or what have you. And so I love this because this is based on the comic strips that were in the Sunday newspapers back in 51. Japan. Yeah, and it was made in Japan. And so I bought a bunch of this hoping that one day I would get a shirt made out of it. And um, I did. Wendy had found the seamstress in a town near here called Occoquan, who we really liked the way she did things. And so she had this made for me. Nice. So now to the first part of the question, what do I think of Disney's overall disregard of the film? Um, I think it's understandable from a business point of view, but I don't agree with it from an artistic point of view. Um, it is true that when it came out, it wasn't as popular as the rest and it did not make money until the 80s really. Um, but I think the art and the, the movie itself is beautiful. Um, I mean, it's, it's got all the giants, you know, working on it, all nine of the nine old men who are directing animators of it. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And it's got these great songs, they're very catchy, they're very memorable. Um, and it's, these days it's better regarded than it was. Still not like Cinderella or Peter Pan, and it never will be because those are more they have a more of a cohesive plot, whereas Alice, you know, by definition is very uh, episodic and there's no real thread running through it. But um, I'm glad to see that it's, it's uh, the company's opinion of it is improving. I just wish that it had been that way sooner. You know, it's funny. I, you know, to direct attention towards me, I have a podcast and a website called Alice is Everywhere. And I thought, boy, I keep talking. I'm strictly Carolian. I should revisit the Alice in Wonderland Disney movie and, and talk about it on my podcast. And I watched it and about halfway through, I realized I've never seen this before in my life. <laughs> I, I just, I had never seen it as a child. I thought I had because we're so familiar with all these iconic images, but I had, I guess I was born in that pocket where it was never going to be in theaters and it wasn't available on video until much later. And well, it, it was really weird because I mean, the movie came out in 51 and then it was not showed in the theaters again until 1974. Um, and it was all, it's only been released in the theaters four times, 51, 74, 81, and 89. Whereas all the other movies, they're very regular on a seven year cycle, at least until video came out, right? Yeah. Um, and so it got shown on TV a few times in the late fifties and early sixties, uh, more sooner than any other movie. It was the very first Disney film to be shown on TV in 1954. Yeah. But um, unless you saw it on the Disney, you know, the Sunday show, as we used to call it, um, or we're lucky enough to see it in, you know, 74 or 81, 
you, you couldn't see it unless it was on video or you rented a 16 millimeter of it or something. So, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's kind of like the book, and I don't know if this is a true statistic, but I've read that Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a book that the most people lie about reading. And I, I think I think they're not even consciously lying. They actually think they've read it because again, these characters are so iconic and familiar. And I wonder if it's kind of similar with the, the Disney movie. I mean, I know gazillions of people have seen it, but if some people like me thought, oh yeah, I, I know that movie, of course I know it. And then when you sit down to watch it, hmm, not so much. Let's see, we have a few more questions left. Linda Cassidy, oh, this could be a, a detailed answer. What is your source for your Marvelous collection? Oh, well, um, it has changed over the years. Um, in the beginning, it was going to, you know, these Disneyana shows or going to generic toy shows. Um, I used to subscribe to this magazine called Toy Shop, which I'm not sure if it's still around anymore. Um, and then a lot of mail order. And then, and obviously eBay came around in 1994. And that slowly started the shift to eBay. I mean, over the years, there have been, um, you know, a, a transition really more than any. There's still shows out there, but obviously not this year. But, um, but really, the majority of things probably in the last 20 years have come from eBay. Or people reaching out to me directly from finding me on my blog. You know, I've had a few things come directly to me. Yeah, actually, this isn't a question about your collection, but the final question will be from me. How does one get a visit from Catherine Beaumont to one's house? How does that happen? Oh, well, we've, we've actually known Kathy for quite a while, since really? uh, the mid-90s. Um, I was introduced to her by our art friend, Stacia, um, and we went to see, we met her at um, a tribute that was done at the Motion Picture Academy for Mark Davis, who's one of the nine old men. And then I sort of struck up a conversation with him um, and her husband at the time. And we just sort of kind of, you know, hit it off. And so over the years, we've become very good friends. And so when Wendy had her big 50th birthday party, we invited her out um, and she came and she spent the, you know, about a week with us and took pictures of the cherry blossoms. And then, you know, wow. she, we got her, we got her nice and drunk one night and she signed the wall for us. Because <laughs> I have no scruples. <laughs> <laughs> someday we'll have to do an entire presentation on on getting Catherine Beaumont drunk and exactly uh, she also came to the exhibit. yeah she did she came out for the Jeppy Museum exhibit as well oh nice all right Matt I think we are finally done with your audience questions so we will see you again at the end for our little panel discussion okay and thank you so much I, no problem. I'll, I'll have to I'll... send you a uh, a transcript of the chat later because yes people are very very impressed <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And before I bring our next presenter on, I am actually going to tell you a little bit about membership in our society. I mentioned earlier one way that you can learn about our events is to follow us on social media. You can also go to our website, lewiscarroll.org. But you know, who wants to go click around and check and see if it's been updated? I mean, you want to know the news from the source, right? So why not become a member? You'll be on our email list. You'll get the news right away whenever we're planning something special for all of you. I'm going to share my screen and just show you because our next event is huge. It is our big spring meeting. We have two big meetings a year, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. This is what's going on April 23rd and 24th. Now, if things were different, we would all be meeting at USC under the watchful eye of LCSNA President Linda Cassidy. Things are not different, so we will be meeting as we are right now, virtually in front of your device du jour. Just think of all the money you're going to sa save on uh, hotels and travel. So April 23rd is more the academic day, but I promise you there's going to be things you want to see on each day. And just look at these speakers in alphabetical order. I am really intrigued by this, the mythological centers of Lewis Carroll's Alice books. This presentation argues that each of the Alice books is a symmetrical work built around a significant center. The center in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is the Cheshire Cat. And through the looking glass, it's Humpty Dumpty. I guess I should have said spoiler alert there. And then the 24th, we've got sort of some more artsy presentations here. We've got Alice in Wonderland Opera, Alice in Japan, virtual reality game. Those of you who attended our show and tell, you got a 
little taste of that from Jackie Lee, then Mark Richards is definitely going to save a lot of money on travel by doing this virtually, as, as will Edward Wakeling and Caroline Luke. So yes, so this is our spring meeting. All are welcome. But if you want to support the Lewis Carroll Society of North America, it's so easy to do on this very same website, lewiscarroll.org. You just go to the join slash renew. And there's membership. Now the night letter is definitely something you're going to want to see. That is our newsletter and it's available in PDF and print form. And look here, students, it's only $20. What a great gift for a, a young Carolian scholar. And then individual membership start at only $42. And yes, that's intentional, of course. All right. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit if you're enjoying these events, might as well become a member. All right. Now our next presenter is Ellie, and I am <laughs> scrolling to her bio. Ellie Schaefer Salins is a third generally third generation Carolian collector. Her grandmother began collecting Alice books in the 1890s, and her parents, Maxine and David Schaefer, greatly expanded the collection and were founding members of the LCSNA. Her specialty interest is collecting Wonderland and Carolian teapots. And she claims to have the largest collection in the world with approximately 215 teapots. She has also researched and presented on the psychological theories named after the characters of Lewis Carroll. Her day jobs are as a social work professor at Salisbury University and a mental health therapist for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. And let's welcome Ellie. Hello. Hello, thank you. Hello, everybody. And I, okay. I apologize. I feel like during my intro there, I sounded dubious when I said that you claim to have the largest collection in I, the world. I, I believe claim. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for someone to tell me they have more, but nobody has done it yet. So, and I recounted my teapots. There's 212, not 215. But I thought when I wrote the bio, I might have gotten a few more. So, <laughs> I have 212 teapots. Close enough. I don't think anyone's going to question no, you on that. All right. Well, I got nothing for you to start with here. Are you ready to begin? I'm ready to go. Awesome. I will hand it over to you. See you in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, everybody. So I am Ellie Schaefer Salins, and um, I'm going to be presenting on my teapot collection. And I've done this presentation before. If some people were at the um, 2019 Philadelphia meeting. Um, I did this presentation there, so I'm sorry if you're going to see it again, but I'll do it a little bit different. And I wanted to start off by showing you one of my teapots. I do a PowerPoint presentation, but then people go, it's really hard to see the size. So this is a teapot. This is one of the only teapots that I actually have uh, gotten commissioned. This is from the website Carters of Suffolk. Suffolk and um, they have teapots with different books by different authors. They had, I went on their site and they had Shakespeare and they had Dickens and they had all different people. And I wrote them and I said, why don't you have Lewis Carroll? And they said, because Lewis Carroll's only written one book. And I said, oh no, oh no, Lewis Carroll's written many more than one book. And now we have a teapot with a lot of his books. We have Wonderland, Looking Glass, The Hunting of the Snark and, um, Symbolic Logic and Sylvia and Bruno, a lot of his different books. The um, top of the teapot is from Underground, which is the original book that Lewis Carroll wrote for Alice Little. And um, there's a picture of the uh, cards painting the roses red, which is in honor of my husband, um, who was a magician and he loved cards. So the reason I'm showing you this teapot is to show, I love this teapot, but also this is about the size of many of my teapots, this is a little on the larger size, but it's the sort of average size of most of my teapots, okay? So as I show you the PowerPoint, you'll know that this is a smaller teapot. So this is um, a smaller teapot that's more of a medium to large size teapot. All right, so to the PowerPoint, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you all can see that. If you can't see that, someone please let me know. Um, so this is my Alice in Wonderland teapot presentation. Uh, it all started with my mother. Uh, you can see a picture of me and my mother. She died in 1996. 
She had about 10 teapots at the time of her death. Obviously, I look very, very young in that picture because it's from before 1996. Um, and um, when she died, I was very, very close to my mother. She was the secretary of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America from the start of the society in the early 70s to about 1994. So many, many people knew her because she welcomed a lot of people to the society. Um, I was incredibly close to my mother. And when she died, I said, I'm going to continue her teapot collection. She had about 10 teapots, which she actually found in stores because before 1996, we didn't have the internet and all the things we have now. So the 10 teapots that she had, she actually went to stores mostly in the United States and in England and found these teapots. So here are some of her teapots in her original collection. And most of these are about the size of the teapot that I just showed you, the book teapot I showed you. That's a smaller teapot down in the bottom left. So these are the original Maxine Schaefer teapots from her collection. And then after she died, I took it over and this is the collection now <laughs> with the 212 teapots. So I have it Yes, smushed. They look smushed into six different cabinets that um, I'm sitting around right now in my living room and dining room. This is one right here. I don't know if you can see there's another one sort of in the corner over there. Um, and so uh, this is the collection. And every time I get one, I know my mother would be thrilled to see another new Alice in Wonderland teapot. So I have 212 teapots in the collection as of right now. Um, and the rules to be in the collection are, uh, the teapot must be made of either ceramic, china, or glass. Um, I do have a teapot made out of newspaper that someone sent to me, which is pages of the book. Um, and I do have a teapot made out of wood, but I actually don't quite count those as part of the collection. Uh, but they're very cool teapots anyway. Um, it should be a one cup teapot or larger. So this size is about a one cup teapot. When you say a one cup teapot, that means when you pour the water out into a teacup, you get about one cup of tea. Um, so it should be a one cup teapot or larger. I don't collect uh, kids sets of teapots, even though I do have a couple, but they're not really part of the collection. Um, to be a teapot, it has to have a lid, a lid that actually works um, and a handle and a spout, okay? So some things people will send me and I'll go, well, that doesn't have a spout or whatever. So this is the rules of a teapot. Um, and it has to have a picture, a scene or a saying or something from the writings of Lewis Carroll. And when I say teapots can be similar, but not the same to be counted as different. Um, so they can look exactly the same, but be a different color or maybe be a different size. And then I count them as uh, two different teapots. So my teapots, unlike my mother, uh, I do sometimes find them in stores, but that's not usually how I get them. I order them online with eBay, Etsy, buying from dealers. Uh, I've been sent teapots in the mail. There was one day that a teapot arrived at my door and it was a friend from a collector in Japan who sent me a teapot from Japan. So um, wonderful, wonderful connections and things that happen when you are an Alice in Wonderland collector. All right, so I'm gonna show you some pictures from what I claim to be the largest Alice in Wonderland teapot collection in the world. I'm going to do this uh, with a poem along with my teapot presentation. So with apologies to Lewis Carroll and Dr. Seuss and any other poet that could be offended, being a great poet, I've often pretended. Okay, here we go. So I'll try to go slow so you can look at the pictures. Teapot blank, teapot dressed, Here's a teapot with a vest. Scary Alice. I find this one very scary. Scary Alice. Mary Alice. Mary, because if you can see, Alice has a Christmas tree behind her and a Tweedle that's either Tweedledee or Dumb looking to be Santa Claus. Alice with flamingos. and a teapot with lingo. So this is one of my many book teapots with a chapter on the front and the back of the book on the back of the teapot. More teapots made out of books. One is the one I showed you. And 
and back to an Alice with an interesting look. So this is one that I got on Etsy that's made uh, one of a kind, made by an artist on Etsy. There are Disney teapots and Tenniel pictures. So for those who don't know what Tenniel, who Tenniel is, he was the illustrator of the um, original Alice published in 1865. And I'm sure these pictures are familiar to many of you. And some teapots are sort of mixtures. So this one has Tenniel and Disney on it, which I thought was sort of interesting. A video game teapot from American McGee. So this teapot is seen on a video game. And a Tweedle teapot with both Dumb and D. So if you look at their collars on one side of the teapot, it says D on the collar and the other says dumb. So we have Tweedle D and Tweedle Dumb. That was a teapot for one. And here's another to view. So teapots for one have the teapot on top of the teacup. And here's a Disney teapot made for two. So you have the teapot on top of two cups, which I think is pretty cool. We're up to three and you see three spouts, it helps to make the tea come out. Those are from Japan and this one also, just look at the cups, then you will know. Does anybody know why I said that? Why are these cups telling me it's from Japan? And since I can't hear you, I'll have to give you the answer. <laughs> um, so I, I know I'm not looking at the chat, but they're from Japan, you know they're from Japan because they don't have handles. So cups um, from that part of the world uh, usually don't have handles. And so these are from Japan. An Alice from Australia. Another from Peru. And here's some from Russia for you to view. This, this is a wonderful artist from Russia. I have several of her teapots, more than these. Yes, that queen of hearts is very well endowed. And this Disney queen is angrily browed. And this queen teapot is very loud. That queen is part of a set by Cardu. This card teapot is from the set too. So Cardu is a teapot maker and uh, there was a big set. So here's the 2001 set, I bought them all here they are smushed in my cabinet over there. And here's Cardew himself. His first name is Paul. So Park, Paul Cardew uh, has a teapot company and he's a teapot manufacturer and he put himself into a limited edition teapot of the King of Hearts. So he's the King of Hearts and here's another King too. And this is the king, or maybe the knave, with a sword that is blue. Now, Mad Hatter teapots. They're yellow, blue, and green. This Disney teapot is the rarest I've seen. Uh, this is a very rare D Disney teapot that's from a very rare set that came out around the uh, 1951 Disney movie. Um, I think he's, he's uh, I actually bought this from Matt. So <laughs> Matt stole this teapot to me out of the back of his car in a parking lot in Virginia. So that's when I first met him and we've known each other for a long time. So thank you, Matt. Um, I think this is an interesting teapot. Notice the teacups coming out of his ear. Uh, 
it's a very interesting teapot from 1951. So yes, this teapot, I went and bought a teapot out of the back of a car. And somehow my husband let me go by myself to do this. Um, so this is a very rare teapot and I'm very happy to have it. The Cardew Hatter looks kind of creepy. And this Dormouse teapot is very sleepy. These dormice look mad, not lazy. And this Cheshire cat is totally crazy. I hope I'm giving you all enough time to see them. I'm trying to go slow. This teapot is from a movie set. So this is from the Tim Burton movie. Um, Johnny Depp is shown in a picture holding this teapot, but he is not holding this teapot. Um, so the teapot was a prop that had eight backup teapots on the set. So I own one of the eight backup teapots. I don't own the actual teapot that Johnny Depp is holding. And I don't know if he, if they ended up using more than one or not, but I do know that eight were made for the movie and I have one of the eight. Um, so that's what this one is. And this is the rarest Carol character found yet. So I don't know if you all know what character that is from the books. I'll give you a second to look at it. And I wish I had shown the back of this one, uh, but uh, hopefully someone got the answer. This is the bat and the Mad Hatter at the tea party says, twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. And that is written on the back of this teapot. There are characters from Looking Glass. Um, Alice becomes a queen in Looking Glass, not in Wonderland. And characters of many kinds. So this teapot has just about every Wonderland character all over it. And these Wonderland characters are hard to find. I know this might be very hard to see on the PowerPoint, but can you all see the characters? Let's see if I can show you. I'll give you a minute to look. So here's the caterpillar. He was sitting over here smoking his hookah, but he became a butterfly. So now he's sitting over here on the handle of the teapot. Love that one. And this one too is a very beautiful teapot. And if you look right there, I don't know if you all can see my cursor, but that's the Cheshire cat. And these are some of the spears from the card, the cards that walk around with the spears. Okay. These rare China teapots have scenes that are old. These scenes are from the uh, Pig and Pepper. It's the, the cook and the duchess in the kitchen. And this pocket watch teapot is made of gold. Well, gold paint, but looks like gold. There are beautiful artist renditions. So these artist renditions are very tall. They're about two to three feet tall, some of them. More artist renditions. These are from a woman named Elizabeth Gomes who uh, does a lot of work for Disney. And these are, and there are those from museum exhibitions. So as Matt showed, I have one from also the um, Australian Center for the Moving Image. I also went to that exhibition and I also have um, some of my father's items there. My father collects Alice in Wonderland movies. So that the teapot that's a little higher is from that exhibition. The one below is from a, a exhibition that was in London a few years back on Alice in Wonderland. And I have mass produced editions. So some of these are fairly easy to find. And this teapot upon inspection is a teapot of an Alice China and teapot collection. So it's a teapot of a teapot collection, which I think is pretty darn cool. But the rarest and most precious teapot is like no other. It's the teapot that the Lewis Carroll Society of North America gave to thank my mother. So after my mother was secretary of the society for 20 years, she was given a gift by the society. 
and this is it. So it's a teapot with the dormouse on top. Everybody called her the dormouse because she fell asleep all the time during meetings. <laughs> and it says her name on the bottom, Maxine Schaefer, and has hearts. So um, I thought that was very wonderful. So that's part of my collection. So I began collecting teapots in 1996. The teapots are varied and show a great mix. Some teapots are big and some are small. Some are colorful and some not at all. Some have a history and interesting stories and others are simple without much glory. There are 212 teapots and each one is unique. Come to visit and take a long peek. Thank you. Ellie, I had the biggest smile on my face for that entire presentation that I'm sure everyone else did if, if we could only turn our cameras on. And I want you to know, people were totally with you. I saw so many no handles when you asked about the, the Japanese. Uh, good. I, I was scared. I was going to try and look at the chat, but I didn't want to get. Oh, scared. yeah. That, yeah I can, trust me, it can be very distracting. And also they were with you on the uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Bat. Although someone oh, good. I'm glad people figured that out. Someone who shall not be named did think it was a Jabberwocky, but you know, we won't. We won't call them out. Um, and also, as long as I am eavesdropping on the chat here, before we get to our official q and I thought you'd like to know a few of these comments. Joel says that Maxine was my first contact on the LCSNA and she changed my life and sent me reeling down the rabbit hole. I will always be indebted to her. So I thought you'd want to hear that. And then mm -hmm. also, uh, where is it? <laughs> Rebecca said, I love so much this list of qualifications to be a part of the collection, very satisfying. And I happen to know Rebecca as a scientist, so that's a nice, <laughs> she appreciates your well, combination of whimsy and data. Yeah. yeah, when you're a collector, you have to make some rules, otherwise you can go totally crazy, so. Yeah, actually, I was wondering why no minis. It would just be, it would just be too much. It would just be too much. And a lot of them are plastic and I didn't want to go there. So mm, um, I have a couple. I, I So every time you have a rule, you break them a little bit. Like <laughs> one of my favorite ones is the one made out of the pages of the book, which is made out of paper. So mm. um, yeah, it's, I could show that one, but it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Cause I kept thinking, what's Alice going to drink out of? At the actual tea party, she's only two feet high. She needs mini ones. So I think someone else should start a collection of just mini ones. That's <laughs> my request. All right. To, on to our questions. This one's kind of similar to mine, just a different type. Uh, Brian asks, no metal teapots? Are they just disallowed or have you never found one? I actually don't have a metal one. I do not have a metal teapot. I have a wood one. I have lots of glass ones and I have the paper one and then the other ones are ceramic, but no, I don't have a metal one. That would be interesting. If someone wants to find me one, I could change my, uh, <laughs> I could change my rules. I, the rules. Said, I do not have a metal one, no. All right, change the rules and get up to 213 then. Yeah. Helping. Uh, Joel asks, who made Scary Alice and how did you find her? Scary Alice, I don't remember the name. I, I'm sure I have it because um, I keep track of these things in my, teapots, but um, it was found online at uh, one of these, uh, I call them scary Alice sites. Um, there's some really kind of dark Alice in Wonderland <laughs> websites and it was found there. Uh, and so she, she is from one of those scary Alice websites. And if you want to know the name, I can find it out for you. All right. Well, this is interesting. Marcus asks, are all of the pots designed more or less for right-handed persons? probably because we're a right-handed world, uh, but I don't know. I could walk around uh, holding them all up and trying to find out, but probably they are, yes. I would assume so. Yeah, certainly it kind of looks that way. Uh, oh, David asked, have you, did you ever break one? Yes. Shh. Um, <laughs> I actually have glued a few together. I've been so upset when I've done it, but yes, there are a few that I have one that I majorly broke and a beautiful artist one that one little piece broke off. And I was, as I was trying to put it in the cabinet, but most of the time I'm pretty good about not breaking them, but yes, <laughs> I, I've broken one or two out of 212. That's not too bad. <laughs> oh, and also I have a note. David is Matt Demacos. My son got into my computer. So that question was not from uh, David. It was from okay. Matt. Thank and also you. just a reminder to everyone, uh, if you have a question for our panelists, use the Q&A feature and not the chat because, you know, I'm kind of trying to keep track of both, but I'm seeing some questions go flying by in the chat there and we may not get to those. Uh, Brian, another question from Brian. Do you have an Alice teapot that you use every day? 
No. A matter of fact, I tell a story that I've only used one of my teapots from the collection and I used it when Christina Bjork came here. Um, I had a tea party and I used one of my teapots when she was here. So if anyone doesn't know who she is, she's written a book about Alice Little. She's also wrote Linnea and Moni's Garden. So she's um, famous in her own right. And uh, I had a teapot, a tea party for her when she came to visit my home. And that's the only time I've used one of my teapots in her honor. Does she know how special she is? Does she know? <laughs> I think I've told her that story. <laughs> if not, <I> wow. <laughs> that'd be a real badge of honor, I think. Uh, Dana, who I think you've met, uh, asks, how many teapots do you find per year about? How much more room do you have? <laughs> Two-part question. Um, so that's an interesting question. So sometimes you'll have um, a set like the Cardew set that I showed where there's like a big set and there's a whole bunch to buy. Um, and sometimes, you know, there seems like there's not a lot. And I, um, uh, it also depends on how much I'm looking. Like sometimes I'll start searching and then sometimes I don't. I've slowed down some because uh, they're getting harder and harder to find, but new ones, it's amazing. New ones are always coming out, just like the books. It's, it's just amazing, the interest in Alice in Wonderland and how books are still published, teapots are still made, toys are still made, movies are still made. So it's, it's, it's incredible. So. And yeah, speaking of which, and you touched upon this a little, but Jean asks, where do you find the teapots? So you did answer that a little, right? There's little eBay. There's some people just present them to you. <laughs> yeah, I've had people just send them to me, but um, mostly eBay, Etsy, um, mostly online. Every once in a while, I'll find one in a store, but that's very rare. Um, but online is an amazing thing. Yeah, that must be a real eureka moment if you happen to come across one in a store. Or, I mean, even a thrift shop or something, that would be very Oh, exciting, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> antique stores or, or will have something or, um, you know, if there's some dealer selling one. Yeah. Now, Kat asks, and I'm guessing the answer is no, because it sounds like you haven't used any of these. Uh, have you ever used a teapot with three spouts? Ever tried to use one of those? <laughs> We, we watch the water come out. A lot of the ones with the three spouts, actually not all three spouts work. Um, some oh. of them, only one spout will work. Um, yeah. So I said, they're looking at the spouts, you know, <laughs> trying to see which ones work. But uh, we have experimented. Yes. That's funny. Anyway. That didn't occur to me. That makes sense that water wouldn't come out of all three spouts. Right? They did yeah. in the movie. In That's the Disney true. movie. <laughs> see, Carolyn asks, do the tops of the dormice teapots come off or are they attached to the mice's heads? Yes, all the tops come off um, and, and all of my teapots, the tops are able to come off. Okay, excellent. Oh my goodness, these questions you keep coming fast and furious. Brian <laughs> Riddle asks, what is the smallest and largest item in your collection? So, um, well, so technically, if I say that it's not smaller than one cup teapot, but I do have some miniatures. I have some really small ones. Um, and then um, larger ones are back here. There's some of the um, artist rendition ones that one of the, uh, the rabbit that I showed you is about this big and I'm not pulling that out. Uh, but then I have a little one that I still think is about a one cup teapot that's about that big. And I can pull some of these out when we talk um, later and show you that. So. Excellent. Now, Joel has a question for you, but it is very similar to, yeah, the panel question, the big panel question I'm going to ask all of you. So, Joel, we're going to hang off on that. Jessica asks, is there any information you can share about the very old set from the slideshow? I think I have a child's tea set from the same collection, same transferware art and coloring, but no information about it. Do you know which one? So, I should... I showed two different teapots that have the same picture, but they're two different kinds. The, the whiter one um, is a very old lusterware uh, teapot from the early 1900s. And the other one had the same pictures from the Duchess and the cook, uh, but that was actually from Australia. And I don't know much about that one, but the white one is, is a very rare kind of, um, I think it's called lusterware um, and it's a very rare China. It almost feels like plastic, but it's China. So yeah. it's interesting. Interesting. And I saved, oh wait, <laughs> I was going to say I saved Sarah's questions for last because I feel like it'll be the hardest to answer, but we just got down to the wire here. What kind of tea? Asks Michael Hancher. What Do kind of it? tea? 
any kind you want, as long as it's hot in the teapots. People people laugh at me because I drink tea a lot, but I drink iced tea. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't usually drink hot tea. So it's very funny. I have 212 teapots, but um, yeah. <laughs> All right. And then Sarah's question is, which is your favorite? I mean, could you possibly pick one? I was trying to pick one just watching your slideshow and I don't think I can. Um, I have a couple favorites. I mean, the one that I showed you at the very beginning that I commissioned um, that has all the books. I mean, where are you going to find a teapot with Sylvie and Bruno other than this teapot and, you know, uh, symbolic logic. So I, I have a special place. And since I dedicated that also to my husband, um, that's at the top of the list. But um, there's other teapots, a lot of the ones that belong to my mother, the one that was made for my mother um, and a couple other ones are very special to me. So. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, because it's really important what I think about your teapots. If I had to choose, what would it be? And I was thinking it'd be that first one you showed, but I thought, but I might just be in colored because you probably have stories about all of them or you can show us little details and, and you know, that's the yeah, only one we saw up close and in person. There's very interesting stories about how I got many of them. Some were on trips and some were from friends and it's, it's really fun. It's really interesting how I've gotten a lot of them where people have alerted me to buy them or yeah. yeah, a lot of different great things. Excellent. Probably not a ton of competition. That's great. You, you are the first Nothing one I people think of. of. Yeah. Right. So if I just keep saying I have the largest collection, one day someone's going to go, no, and they're going to prove me wrong. But so far in uh, 20 years or however long that's been, uh, almost it'll be 20, well, since 1996. So uh, 15 years, maybe that um, hasn't happened. So I guess 15 years to do my math. Um, it hasn't happened. Yeah, I kept imagining um, maybe someone logging in with who has 211 teapots and like, ah, curses. And then they well, just the leave person, in a huff. The person that I know is second, who I believe is on here is Edward Wakeling. And he has I, probably 42 teapots because that's like Edward. He has around 40 something <laughs> um, teapots. So I know he's uh, up there at second that I know of. So yeah. 42, that's a good place to stop. If you're going to stop, that, that's a when to do it. All right, Ellie, thank you so much. I think that is the end of our audience questions. So we will see you again at the panel. And again, that's lovely. I had a big smile on my face the whole time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And before we bring on our last presenter, I wanted to not remind you all because I neglected to tell you at the beginning, we are having a social hour after our presentation today. Now that will be on a different Zoom link because it turns out there's no magical way to turn a Zoom webinar into a Zoom meeting. I'd have to go through and like change each of you to a panelist and that would be a bit of a bother. So I'm putting the info in the chat here. At the end, I will put the actual link as well, but if y'all wanna jot that down there. Uh, we've, we've heard from some of you saying you are hungry for more social events to actually mix and mingle in person, not just in chat with your your fellow Corollians. So that will be going on immediately following our presentation today. Now let's bring on our next presenter. Alan Tannenbaum has been actively collecting all aspects of Coroliana, I practice that, for more than 35 years. He retired from IBM after 33 years and now devotes a significant amount of time to book collecting, writing, and networking with other collectors, scholars, and book dealers around the world. A past president of the LCSNA, Alan has lectured various aspects of Lewis Carroll. His publications include co-editing Pictures and Conversations, Lewis Carroll and the Comics from 2003, technically editing Alice in a World of Wonderlands, the translation of Lewis Carroll's masterpiece from Oak Knoll in 2015, and the privately published Square Alice, which I'm very intrigued by. He lives in Massachusetts with his wife, Allison, who also writes on Corollian subjects. He co-curated the 2015 exhibition, Alice in Translation, at the Grolier Club, which I was fortunate enough to go see, and it was fabulous. Welcome, Alan. Hello. I assume you can hear me fine. I can hear you. I can see you. And yes, actually, I meant to mention at the beginning, it looked like some people were having trouble uh, seeing the video, but that was all resolved. I guess if you shut the full screen and then open it again somehow it, it fixes itself and then also uh, to answer yes we are recording this presentation today it will most likely go up on our youtube channel at some point all right alan take it away okay thank you heather and uh, i really enjoyed the first two presentations uh i also dabble in disney and i dabble in teapots 
but I leave those domains for uh, the experts. Uh, I collect everything else and uh, I'll show you a, a bit of it. Uh, I'm in a room uh, outside of my, my room, the, uh, the Carol room, uh, to show you this one piece here. I'll start here. I like big things. I like small things. Uh, this one is 42 by 42. And it was in fact on the cover of uh, the night letter in fall 2020, number 105. It was actually pressed on the streets of San Francisco by the steam uh, roller that you actually see there, a uh, seven ton thing. And it's a, it started as a linotype, uh, as a, uh, yeah, linotype. And uh, they pressed it, they pressed 10 copies of that. And I got one of them, I was lucky enough to get one of them. And so now we will move into Wonderland. Many of you were here, or some of you were here in 2012. Um, I hope you can see all that. And I'm gonna go around the room and um, tell you what I've got, just sort of as an overview. And then we'll start with something light. We'll go to something a little more serious and then we'll end on something light. Um, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, as many of you Carol collectors know, Alice touches every domain of collecting. And since I am a completist uh, or an omnivore or whatever you wanna call it, and a peripheralist, um, I have quite a number of things. And since 2012, I may have picked up a few things that you haven't seen. So going around the room, uh, you can see in the far corner there, that you can see uh, all sorts of ceramic ware, little chachkillas, uh, uh, little figurines. And we move across and collect um, books that were published in Carol's lifetime and the series then extended into the 20th century um, and of course into the 21st century. And we'll go through some of those. Uh, then we've got some more of the more important things in the uh, as we go around, some translations are in the far cabinet. We come to some interesting things like pinball machines, artwork on the walls, uh, videos and CDs and, and what have you, those, that old technology. Uh, and then we continue around the room with the reference library and uh, various editions of illustrated Alice's um, and what's what is an Alice without illustration? So um, let's start over here. On the wall, we have some uh, we have two illustrate two uh, uh, paintings by Grace Slick. Grace Slick being the author of the White Rabbit song. Um, got to talk to her. It was very interesting. One of the great things about collecting is uh, you get to meet a lot of people, either dealers or other collectors, and you spend most of your time just chatting about stuff that you have. Uh, hopefully that will result in some connection down the road. And um, uh, that certainly has happened to me over the years. I've been collecting for about 35 plus years. Uh, and uh, I started with a fairly small room. We have moved three times, four, three times. This is the fourth house. And this room is actually custom built. It's purpose built, if you will, uh, knowing the collection that I had. Um, I drove a real estate agent crazy when we were looking for houses. Eventually, we eventually found a house where we could extend the house. Uh, and I made sure that the bookcases were as tall as possible, that the windows were as small as possible, and we have an extra wall over there because I always was running out of room for artwork. And guess what? They're still running out of room for artwork. We run out of room for books. We run out of room for just about everything. Uh, so I have tried not to bleed out of this room into other parts of the house, but we have actually taken over a bedroom wall two walls in that bedroom, 
One is very tall, so it's got art. It has art on it, and the other one has just got teapots and other silverware and, and tableware. So that's the gray slick thing. Um, moving across, let me show you something that I didn't have in 2012, which is probably, I'm gonna start with the creepiest thing in the room. I'm anticipating a question. It's the creepiest thing for sure. It is, in case you don't recognize him, it is W.C. Fields. It is a life mask taken from his actual face in order to produce the makeup for the 1933 film. He was, of course, unrecognizable. He was Humpty Dumpty. Most of him was under, the, under a table. You could, under, you, you could tell it was him from his voice. Uh, but I do collect, I do try to collect as much as I can, as, as uh, unique an item as I can from the film, from the 1933. I do have uh, uh, the file copy of the script from Paramount Studios from 1933. It's dated uh, December 33, of course, which is when they shot the film. Um, so let's move across. Um, many of you probably know that back in the ninth, back in the turn of the century, there was not much in the way uh, there weren't movies, there was hardly electricity. And so the, uh, 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 a popular form of entertainment was to watch a slideshow and listen to live music and listen to a narrator tell the story. And Alice slides uh, were, were pretty popular uh, at the time. And then they sold sets, you could take them home and I guess play them on your own, uh, project them on your own, what they call the magic lantern. And this would fit in, it would slide across, there would be a chemical light behind it, very powerful, and you'd shine it onto a screen or onto a wall. And uh, when we moved here, I had a set and I was planning to do something with it. I didn't know exactly what, and then it came to us that we had, we built this doorway. It used to be, it used to be a, a, um, a window into the old living room. This is a 1770 house. <laughs> this is a 2006 edition. Uh, and so we replaced it with a, with a door, with a glass panel, found somebody a few years ago to take all 24 slides, put them in order, do a beautiful design as far as I'm concerned. We'll put a maze on the bottom. And um, uh, now we have this beautiful door that we can go through and it tells the story of Alice. Moving along, um, we obtained these beautiful glass, this is a glass set of gla five glass figurines was designed and uh, produced by a woman named Edris Eckhart, who was in the 1930s, the head of the WPA uh, artistic wing, if you will. And then um, I believe, and so she produced, her specialty was producing glass. And this is, it's really a beautiful uh, piece. And along with it, I have the mold that was used to make it. And then we have the same thing for the five. And uh, we were lucky enough to find Justin Schiller a few years ago, and Justin showed it to us. Um, well, I've known Justin for many years, but he showed it to us. I think he was hiding it. And um, it took us a few years, but we finally acquired it. Now, next thing, uh, and I'll ask everybody to raise their hands. How many people have Alice in Wonderland bookends? Now, there are a few bookends to be had. Brentano's in New York made some. And in fact, this was one. It's the Atlas of Three Queens. But you typically cannot find bookends for, that are with an Alice thing. And why would that be? I mean, Alice is such a popular book to have and a, and a subject. Well, the answer is because if you have an Alice collection, you have no room for bookends. 
<laughs> you can't, I can fit a bookend on, on these shelves if I wanted to. The only time you need bookends is when you're rearranging the books and then you put them away. Uh, or you just treat them as art, which I'm doing with these two now. I came across these uh, by a, an artist named um, Ralph Massey. These are bronze and uh, they're really beautiful. They're chock full of Alice characters. It weigh, they weigh eight pounds each. I don't believe he made many of them because this is number three and I've never seen them outside of, I've never seen another pair of them. Also, there's a letter opener that sort of goes with it by the same artist. So put that down and we'll move across here. What else is there? Oh, it's good for now. As you can see, lots of other ceramics. When you're a collector, I guess when you're a serious collector, when you're trying to fill in the, the holes, you get to be pretty much an expert in, or somewhat of an expert in various fields. So in this case, Royal Dalton, for example, or Fitz and Floyd, or uh, these glass pieces by Idris Eckhart, you start learning, you start reading more about them. And, uh, and to a certain degree, you even, you learn how to repair them. You, you find other people who are experts in them. So that's part of the fun of collecting is meeting other people, learning new skills. Let's talk a little bit about some uh, manuscript material and books. The books on the shelf uh, represent um, all of the various series and the various titles that Carol uh, wrote um, and, and published. Uh, Macmillan was Carol's primary um, publisher and they published the Alice books in a number of series, combined, miniature, a cheaper edition, a more expensive edition. There's the New York office, there's the London office. If you're a serious collector of Carol, you go after all of them. You go after, um, you go after all of the printings of all of the editions. And uh, Macmillan must have known, Carol must have known there were pe people collecting because Every thousand, every thousand copies of a book, every thousand print uh, copies of a book, they would change the title page. And so for some of the crazy people that are, that are serious collectors, we go after as many of the printings as we can. Um, and um, that's all I can say about that right now. First edition of Alice, of course, was, was the 1865 Alice uh, published in London, uh, Carroll and his illustrator, John Tenniel, did not care for the quality of the, of the publication. And so uh, it, and it's a fairly well-known story. They had it re reset, re republished, and the original pages were sold to a firm in New York, New York City named Appleton, and they were 1,452 copies sold over to Appleton. And if you can get a hold of that, you can get as close to the original first edition as possible, really. Uh, of the original ones, before the 1,452 were sold to New York, uh, Carroll gave away 48 copies, uh, probably, in, well, probably inscribed some of them, and uh, called them back. Didn't get them all back. But uh, as a result, we, we know the whereabouts of 22 or 23, depending upon how you count, of those editions. If you can get an 1866 copy from the Apple, with the Appleton title page in it, you essentially have the first edition, except for that one page and the binding. Uh, and that's what this is. Then the, the, the first published edition uh, released by, uh, by uh, Macmillan was in 1866, and that's what this is. The, first, the, the, the next version of, of Alice to come out was actually pirated 
by uh, a, a gentleman named Haney in the United States who, uh, you know, it's called a pirated edition, but it really isn't pirated in that there weren't copyright, there weren't, um, hold on, there's a decline. There wasn't a um, recognized international copyright, at least not by the United States in, in that time period. So Haney was free to, to just steal, if you will, uh, uh, an Apple, uh, a copy of Alice when it came out. And he actually published it in a serialized form complete with the Tenniel illustrations. And the, uh, this is one of them. This is, the, this is the copy that he published in 1869 in what's called Haney's Journal. It's actually a beautiful journal. Uh, it's a national, it's a natural history uh, magazine. The, the engravings are beautiful. And he published Alice in a, in a series of eight uh, serialized forms complete with uh, a subset of Tenniel's uh, drawings. Um, another thing I'll show you here is the electrotypes, the wood blocks that Tenniel made. Uh, he, he, car, he hand, he, well, he drew the blocks. He gave them over to a, uh, an engraver. They engraved the wood blocks. And then because they were engraved on boxwood, they're, they're fairly soft. You can't publish a lot of copies with it. You'll ruin them. So they chemically make a, a metal plate and uh, let me turn on the light here. And so recently, uh, some of these plates came up for uh, sale and uh, along with uh, George Cassidy uh, and Linda Cassidy, we got, we went, we got together and we uh, acquired a number, uh, a small number of, of these electrotypes some from Looking Glass and some from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Then what's here are letters, photographs, um, let me close that off. Um, the way I keep, the way I store manuscript material is in a acid-free envelope in a mylar sheath inside. But then I tried to duplicate as closely as I can the item on the outside just to minimize the handling. And then we, I put them in a box that's about the right size. And so here's a photograph taken by Carol of, uh, of Beatrice and Ethel Hatch, two of his uh, child friends. This, you might recognize this. Um, image of Carol, it's an assisted self-portrait probably taken when he was uh, testing his chemicals on a new, uh, new season, he's taken it out of storage and uh, he had somebody take the lens cap off and take a photograph of himself. Um, uh, I'm always indebted to people like Edward Wakeling for putting me in touch with people who can uh, be a source for these things. The more rare, the more interesting, the better when you're a, when you're a diehard collector. And so I have a number of photographs. I have a number of letters that Carol wrote. Um, here's, a, here's a postcard that he wrote in French in mirror writing to a, uh, to a child friend. And so what I've done is I've enhanced the ink I've flipped it over so we can read it, and I put it in the envelope. I have about 20, 25 letters. I have about five photographs. Uh, and then there are um, early versions of his publications. Uh, you may or may not know about uh, a word game called doublets, also known as word ladders, where you change one word to another by, cha by changing one letter at a time. Um, there were several editions of, the, of well, Carol devised 
the game, if you will. And he issued it in abridged versions. He originally called it word links. So this is even before it was called doublets. Um, and so this is pretty, pretty early. Uh, and then they were published in bound books. Um, in 1869, um, a number of things happened. Carol's first poetry book was issued. It was called Phantasmagoria. And here's a copy of it. You may recognize the, recognize it by the constellation on the, on the cover, Phantasmagoria. This one was inscribed by Carol to Alexander Macmillan, his publisher. He and Macmillan had a pretty close relationship for many, many, many years. And um, I was very happy to, to get an inscribed copy to Macmillan. Another inscribed copy that I particularly like and I thought I'd show you is The Hunting of the Snark, which is Carol's third most popular book after Wonderland and Looking Glass. And this one is in the dark blue binding. As you might know, uh, Carol issued his books in different colors. Um, um, some are much harder to find than others. I think I have just about all of the colors um, that they were issued in. And this one is inscribed to Henry Holliday, who is the who is the illustrator of the snark to his 10 year old daughter, Winifred Holiday. I went past that pretty quickly. Um, Winifred Holiday from the author. Uh, this is the day before publication, March 29th. Well, that is the day of the publication, March 29th, 1876. And then the third inscription I'll show you is also from 1869, from the same as Phantasmagoria. And it is an inscription to the first translator of the first translation of the Alice books into German. So the, the uh, the translator was Anthony Zimmerman. And so it reads, with the author's kind regards and grateful acknowledgement of her uh, assistance, February, 1869. That was also the same year that the first French came out. Okay, so um, that's that. What's, uh, I mentioned Phantasmagoria, which was the first uh, attempt by, well, attempt, the first publication by Carroll of his poetry in a book, in an anthology of poetry. It was reissued in 1883 under a different name called Rhyme and Reason. And this time he hired uh, Arthur B. Frost to illustrate it. And he took his more comical poems and put them in the book and included the snark at the end. Um, Carol really enjoyed working with Frost for that book. He didn't enjoy him in the next, for the next book, but that was, uh, that's a different story. Uh, but one, uh, a few years ago, probably 15 years ago, I had an opportunity to buy the, um, illustrations for one of the poems. There are four, five illustrations for a poem called The Lang Horton. Uh, I happen to like this one a lot. That's the Poppin' Jay. And so uh, I acquired that. Now let's move on. Trying to not take up too much time. Uh, one of the things I like to collect that I found years ago and started collecting were Mardi Gras doubloons. 
these are the coins. They're very lightweight. They can be very heavy. I mean, the, there are special ones that are given uh, to special people in New Orleans at the time of Mardi Gras by the crew, the K-R-E-U-E, E-W-E, uh, which, is the, which are the social clubs. They also uh, have their parades and they have their floats within the parades. And Alice seemed to be a very popular thing. So all of these doubloons are very lightweight. They're made out of aluminum. They threw them off, sort of like beads, but you throw the, the, the balloons and they all have Alice themes. I've been through all of the crews. I've talked to people in New Orleans and I've, I'm pretty sure I have a complete set with all of the different colors for all of the ones. And this is not the only tray, but this is one of them. Uh, and let me just show you these pinball machines, which I would also consider to not be very common. Um, this one is 1955, made by a company named Williams, better known as Bally nowadays. And this one was made by, Got, uh, by Gottlieb, 1948. It in fact is the very first pinball machine to have electromagnetic flippers. And it has six of them. The problem is if, you're, if you have one of these machines, you need to restore it, you need to repair it. It's the same box and, electrics and, and uh, electrical mechanics, which electromechanical uh, uh, layout as Humpty Dumpty which was the same year, but much more popular. And so if you, have a, if you have an Alice machine and you're trying to get replacement parts, you're fighting with the Humpty Dumpty people, fittingly. And uh, I actually had this restored last year. Uh, it works nicely. And it's not like a modern pinball machine. It doesn't have all the laser sounds and bells and whistles. But it has a good old feel to it. Okay, um, that's sort of a, uh, a quick overview as to what's going on here. And Heather, would you like to open it up? I, yes, if somebody sir. saw something specific they'd like to talk about or other well, questions. I, I would like to know who has the high score on the pinball machine. Uh, actually, uh, my nephew. Ah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Two Thanksgivings ago. That's right. <laughs> all right. We do have a plethora of questions here. Uh -oh. um, let's see. I want to group them into. I'm just going to run for a second. I need to get a drink of water. Absolutely. And I think we can all, <laughs> I mean, I think we're all very impressed here. I mean, this is the tiniest little bit of the collection we just saw, right? And. I mean, look at all that behind him. Oh, my heavens. All right. Here's someone who wants, Dee Dee wants this. to know, what will you ultimately do with your collection? Do you plan that's to That's a good question. It? And it, yeah. That's a good question. And it's come up many times. And the answer is, I'm still considering. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I'm not the only one in this situation. And so uh, several of us do discuss, not necessarily Carolian things, but just, you know, a member of the uh, Tickner Society here in Boston, local bibliophile book collector group. And uh, we regularly talk about that kind of subject. It's not, a, it's not a simple, it's not an easy answer. Do you have universities like vying for it? Like well, trying to win your you favor? Know, in, the, in the instant vicinity, I have Harvard, right? Harvard has a great collection. Um, uh, people you know, trying to give your collection to somebody. You can't even give it practically because then what do they do with it? They need an endowment. They need to catalog it. They need space. They need to show it off. Um, uh, now, I happen to have cataloged everything you see. And I've, been I've been cataloging. I've been keeping up with cataloging for the 35 years, too. Uh, on the very first IBM PC that came out, because I worked for IBM and I got an early PC, with all of 48K memory in it. I didn't say mega, I didn't say terra, <laughs> uh, 48K. And so, as you might imagine, the 
the, my cataloging program has evolved over the years as I had more ability to scan pictures, take photographs, uh, uh, keep more and more details, keep links out to other things. Um, so, um, so there's no, there's no real good answer for you yet uh, that I have about what I'm doing with my collection. All right. Fair enough. I'll accept it. But I, you know, I don't plan on stopping for a while. So <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah, no, obviously you got it. I'm just trying to figure out everything behind you. I need to stop doing that. All right. <laughs> Kat wonders, how many teapots do you have? Oh, gee, I don't know. <laughs> no, nowhere near 211. All right. Uh, I probably have on the order of 25, 30, something like that. They Along with plates and silverware and uh, other tableware. So you could host a whole dinner party, really. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, Allison has made tablecloths and, oh, nice. um, you know. Dana wants to know, what was your first piece? Uh, well, my first Carol item was the Annotated Alice okay. uh, by Martin Gardner. Uh, I needed a, uh, I need a cop. I needed a, uh, I was using Jabberwocky, the poem, to illustrate a technical book I was writing at IBM. And I didn't have one. And I knew one, you know, the same stanza that everybody knows that maybe the opening one was brillig. Uh, and I needed the rest of it. So I found, I happened to buy the annotated Alice instead of just a copy of Looking Glass. And uh, it really, it really sparked my uh, my collecting, I got I got sparked my interest in Carol, um, and then I met David and Maxine Schaefer, and their 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 enthusiasm was infectious, and uh, got me going and introduced me to more. You know, it, well we only lived a mile from each other, so oh wow that was yeah that was all serendipity. And I'm sure, I mean, I'm wading through these questions, but I bet someone else asked, how did you start collecting? So you went and killed two birds with one stone there. Excellent. Well, I think I had the collecting gene, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, yeah. I don't know, you know. Some people would call it maybe a hoarding gene. Uh, but um, I, I, even as a kid, I always had checklists of things I was trying to fill up. So uh, all my other collecti collections, there weren't many of them, but they were you know, collecting magazines or, you know, every copy, every issue. And um, they all went out the window as, as the Carol collection grew and grew and grew. And the Carol collections do not stop. In case you're thinking about collecting Carol, um, like I said, Carol and Alice touch every domain of collecting. So you'd be surprised all the different things that are in here that you can't see. <laughs> and actually you kind of touched on Brian wonders is it challenging being an omnivorous <laughs> collector which it is I'm nowadays sure it is. i think um uh it's uh in the early days as was mentioned earlier you, know, you go to antique stores uh or you read the toy journal or you read antiques journals or what have you looking for things uh and you find things here and there and then you have to write letters and or call people um ebay changed the world of course uh, but I also go to paper fairs, I go to book fairs, I go, you know, I spend most of my time there talking to dealers or to collectors. Um, um, so Interesting. it's, it, I would think just looking around, it would be hard to start a Carol collection now. It's, it's possible. It's possible, but uh, um, I don't see a lot out there. Hmm. It's all been snatched up by the likes of you. Well, yeah. <laughs> Some, well, I haven't been snatching up lots of things. I snatch <laughs> up sort of the uh, the things I don't have, right. right? Which are pretty. I wouldn't say rare, but I mean, they're you know, I, I always look for the very interesting. Nobody has it. I've never seen it before. Type of item, um, and you run into those every once in a while. Well, you know what? Actually, we've got several sort of superlative questions here that kind of leads into that from what you just said. What is, someone asked, where is it? What is your oldest non-book item? Do you know? Oh, 
oldest as in I've had it the longest? Well, let, I, I interpreted it as question, old, but yeah, I interpreted it as oldest, like oldest in existence. Yeah, right. Um, non book. I well, I have some handkerchiefs. I have some. I have some music from the 1870s, um, uh, which came out right after the Alice books. Um, I have a, uh, one thing I didn't mention was the, uh, the original manuscript that Carol wrote out for Alice as a gift after he told the story to Alice and her sisters. Um, it was, Alice held on to it for many years, sold it in 1928, and then um, it was bought by a famous uh, dealer, A.S.W. Rosenbach, who then, uh, uh, it was then acquired by Eldridge Johnson, um, who was the president of the Victor Talking Machine Company, the Victrolas, right? I just happened to have had a Victrola uh, of the same, of 1928, and it was here before I ever started collecting Carol. Um, and it's still here. Um, and it used to be in this room, but uh, little by little things have to move out uh, if they're not truly Alice stuff. And so that's an old, that's an old 20th century thing. Um, I mean, there are biscuit tins. There are things that had Carol's blessing, if you will. Uh, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't give his blessing or his copyright to many things during his lifetime. He was always worried about um, holding on to his intellectual property. And do you remember the story? Was it he was disgusted that they actually put biscuits in the biscuit tin? Yeah, that's <laughs> right? true. <laughs> that's true. He, uh, he was upset. He wrote to the, to the biscuit tin manufacturer and said, but the ones you sent me, I asked for some samples. He asked for some samples. And, but the ones you sent me have, these biscuits in them. People can't use that, these things. They have biscuits in them. So at least that's the story I heard. Well, we both heard it, so it must be true. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, maybe you heard it from me. <laughs> All right, Sarah wonders, and I think this might be my favorite question so far, how often do you purchase something you later realize you already have? Has that ah, happened? That's the beauty of cataloging mm. and making sure you have lists and carrying them around. There are many times when I think I've had a duplicate, but I'm not exactly sure and I'll buy it and I'll bring it home and I'll find out it's not because I'm crazy collector and I'm looking for variants. I'm looking for slightly different dust jackets or, or what have you. And, um, but it's been a long time since I bought something as a duplicate accidentally. Um, that's always the advantage of cataloging and keeping lists. Uh, for many years, I kept lists in my wallet, right? Or I carried around lists on my first PDA, right? Now I carry lists on the web through my cell phone. I can always look things up. Yeah, I life. bet maybe that would happen in the earlier days of collecting for you. That right, now, especially now you just when have you're in the collecting, your especially when you're collecting every printing of the Macmillan books. I mean, I have watched Selwyn Goodacre. I know you're out there, Selwyn. <laughs> Sitting, stooping down, counting the reprint number on the, on the back of the title page, and then looking it up and trying to see whether or not he has it. And that impressed me so much. I never told him this <laughs> until now. Uh, that I, and I caught that habit. There aren't a lot of people I know that are that collect all of the thousand printings or all of the editions of the miniature editions or or what have you. Right. But uh, we're out there. And if you get the bug, uh, it, it is a lot. To, there's a lot to collect out there. I mean, it's a lot that you could collect out there. You're making me laugh too much, and it's disturbing my my virtual background. I have to stop moving around here. <laughs> So we have a few. I didn't people. even get into comic books, by the way. I actually have a stack of things here I was going to show, but I, I realized I'm just running out of time. Uh, you know, we, we produced the comic book bibliography back in 2005 or three of all references of, of comic books with references to, to some Carolian Carol aspect. We haven't updated it now in 15 years, and it has really grown. 
um, and we probably should. And I'm sure if Mark Burstein's out there, he's saying, yeah, yeah, I've been telling you that. <laughs> so it's Mark Burstein and myself and Byron Sewell. Um, uh, I was yeah, Mark, show, Mark you know, Burstein. Here's, a, Ooh, here's nice. a, uh, a first edition of Doctor Strange, which you, you know, everybody knows Doctor Strange nowadays because of the, fi- because of the movie and with, you know, Cumberbatch and, and what have you. Uh, but it was Frank Brunner who illustrated the first one. And he's pretty famous for his other stuff like Howard the Duck and uh, some other non-mainstream underground type illustrations, although it was commercially very successful. Uh, but this one is signed by Brunner because I probably have the largest collection of Frank Brunner Alice related drawings that he's done, including his concept pencil drawings and his proof drawings and his final ones uh, and ones that he's colored by hand. Um, and I have portfolios full of that stuff, but I just give you a, a feel for, I'm he- pretty heavy into comic books, comic book uh-huh. art. Uh, and that's all pretty, it's all pretty lucrative slash uh, collectible nowadays. It's very big. A lot of auctions. Mark Persin actually is not with us today. And there's a few questions about White Rabbit. And I'm tempted to tell, um, since he's not here, one of Mark Burstein's stories about White Rabbit. I'm going to save that for the social hour, though, since we're going so long here. Um, But I'm going to go ahead and usurp his story. We have a few people asking, what is an Appleton worth these days? Hmm. Well, you know, depends if you collect, if if you ask a collector... I'll give you one. I mean, a, a, a Carol collector. Carol collector, you know, we've come up through the ranks and we've seen the prices go from the low thousands to maybe mid, you know, maybe 5,000 uh, ish. Uh, if you find them in very good condition, some dealers feel proud enough to charge up to 20,000, 30,000. It depends. Uh, they are getting harder to find, um, but they're out there. There are quite a number. If you go look on ABE books or Via Libre, uh, you can find Appleton books pretty easily. A lot of dealers bundle them. First edition of Alice with uh, either the New York and the, or the London, along with the London looking glass. Um, and then they charge a you know, it's hard to say. It, okay. it, based on condition, whether or not the binding has been replaced, whether or not the binding has, has been completely rebound in a, in a fine binding. Um, I don't know if I can give you a better answer. Oh, no, that's a great uh, answer. And an a Appleton few people... itself is somewhere, I would say, somewhere between five and ten. Gotcha. And that was a few people did phrase it that way, a range, because, of course, you can't just give a a flat answer for that. I got mine 10, 15 years ago. Uh, Edward G. wonders, what's your least expensive acquisition that turned into a most valuable item? Hmm. It's a tricky one. The comic book I showed you is pretty good. Okay. Um, I saw a copy of that go up on... on, uh, heritage in what they call, you know, uh, in the rating system, it goes from zero to nine, if you will, 9.5. You never see anything greater than that. That's something that's that old. Uh, but in a nine condition, it can go for $25,000. Okay. Now, assuming I would give it up, and I probably wouldn't, uh, because that's unscribed to me. What are you going to do? It stays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I almost bought the original art for that page, for the one page that's in that issue, which is Alice, which is the caterpillar sitting on a mushroom in Central Park. It's part of the story uh, at the end. And in fact, uh, I bought this, which is a limited edition uh, by the same artist. And there's the, this is the caterpillar. That's Howard oh. the Duck and all his other characters, Doctor Strange and, and what have you. But I only bought it for that, because it's got the Alice, uh, I can't see it from- Oh, I can see it, yeah. Can you see it? Okay, good. Uh, I'm only looking at a little corner. I should be (laughs) touching that maybe. 
Um, and then I have an entire binder of his stuff. But what what was that? That could be one. Okay. Um, uh, Actually, as long as we're talking about the the big ticket items here, uh, several people are asking what is your most valuable and or more, most expensive item. Uh, or if you don't want to divulge that, you don't have to. Yeah. Well, you know, the inscribed books get up there, mm -hmm. depending upon who they're inscribed to. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. All right. Now, here's yeah, a, a question from... Think. <laughs> Which one? What hurt the most recently? <laughs> that, you know, that, that's that's what it comes down to. Um, but Actually, Alan, on, will I'll you think be think about that? Okay. Will you be joining us for social hour after this? Sure. Do you think? Okay. You know what? I'm going to since we are approaching two hours. I'm going to ask you a few questions, which you know you don't have to do this, but some people are requesting to see certain things from your collection. You know, if you okay. can't do that, that's fine. Um, and then maybe the rest of these you all can ask during the social hour. Cause again, we haven't even done our little panel yet and we're coming on, on two hours here. And where was it? Jan, Susina, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Asked, could you show a few of your music posters that feature, feature Alice imagery? I saw the East Totem West white rabbit. What is the psychedelic poster that was shown early on? It's on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And if it's too okay. much trouble, you know. That's you a don't... quick one. Okay. That's a quick one. All right. Because I anticipated showing that, and I, if I had time, now I could actually run upstairs and get them, but I think what I'll do is I'll show you this. Um, that is a series of, can you see that? I can, yes. Okay, series of five posters done by a woman named Kathy Hill, along with a guy named Sachs. In, eight, in 1968, 1969, uh, that's obviously the caterpillar and the white rabbit, the walrus and the carpenter, and the mad hatter, and the psychedelic black light posters. Um, a, a friend of mine nowadays, uh, he was on the Antiques Roadshow, Gary Somers. Uh, he's the guy with the gray ponytail. He was always showing, showing pop art stuff. Uh, he found a few of these for me. Uh, the rare one is the one on the right. It's called Alice and the Jabberwock. And outside of the one I bought from a guy in Australia, um, I have never seen another one. But it's the same series by Kathy Hill. Uh, then I have a whole bunch of other psychedelic uh, black light posters that you would find in people's dorms or dorm rooms around the around that era. The, the one of the, of the uh, white rabbit on the wall is an iconic one uh, from the 60s. Moving you, don't get dizzy. <laughs> um, by a guy named Joe McHugh, who I got to know on the West Coast. There's a book about the press, East Totem West. Oh. Um, and in here, there are a bunch of what, they, what he calls, uh, I just happened to open to it, but there are a lot of posters in here, like the White Rabbit and the Cheshire Cat, which have nothing to do with Tenniel's Cheshire Cat. In fact, the cat isn't even smiling, but it's <laughs> called the Cheshire Cat. And it says, we're all mad in the background, which shows up in the black light. Um, and this one says, keep, um, keep your head. No, wait, wait, yeah, keep your head. As opposed to feed your head, <laughs> which isn't the word, which are not the words that the Dormouse said, even though they're at the, the end of the White Rabbit song from Grace Slick, where the, you know, the Dormouse said, feed your head, feed your head. Never said that. Um, and I told that to Grace Slick, by the way. She couldn't care less. Um, but um, we're all mad. Yes, I was she told might, by Mark Burstein that Grace, this, huh? Grace, Grace Slick never read the book, that she only saw the movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Uh, she was very nice, by the way, in case she sees this. <laughs> uh, but uh, the overprints, um, there are 
Joe, Joe McHugh experimented back in the 60s with taking this white rabbit image and overprinting it on Oscar Wilde or on this uh, background, this uh, psychedelic background. Uh, there's Oscar Wilde. Anyway, I bought from him the prints that are actually used in the book here. So that's cool. All right. Now let's take up one thing that people don't ask or do ask a lot of times is where do you put all of this stuff that you can't show? I mean, you can't possibly put all this stuff on the walls. So some of it is rolled up and it's in tubes or it's flat. Uh, and it's another advantage I suggest if anybody builds a room like this, a false wall. So you have, or a room behind Ooh. it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have place. I was going to use that for, for, uh, putting on dust jackets, uh, you know, doing paper cutting and doing, uh, uh, you know, work with tools. <laughs> and there's no room back there <laughs> because I got boxes of comic books and I've got, I've got five file drawers, five, five highs back there. You, you need a lot of storage space for, for collections like this. Um, what was the other, so that was the question. That was the question, yeah. And I actually, I think we are going to invite our other presenters okay. back now for our little panel discussion. So okay. Ellie and Matt, if you two want to show yourselves. And again, I apologize. I see there are still some open questions here, but if y'all attend our social hour, Alan will be there and you can ask him in person. And Alan uh, Selwyn thanked you for the nice mention, by the way, <laughs> in the chat here. <laughs> Hello, Ellie and Matt. Welcome back. I didn't have a back. chance to look at the attendees <laughs> list. Yeah. All Oops, right. I'm changing the gallery view so I can see all your lovely faces. Now, my big question for all of you, and I think I know the answer to Ellie's, which is kind of funny because um, someone else here is the cause of it, is what is the one that got away? <laughs> what is the one item that you were just dying to get that either... You mean I this? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that. <laughs> that is it. And I'm going to Matt's house because I do know where he lives and it's not far from me. <laughs> well, for a long time, it was um, Alan uh, that had that uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum teapot that I wanted. And I thought it was a one of a kind. I got the sun on me. Here. Tea for one. The tea for one Tweedle teapot right there. Um, and I really wanted that. And then I would have paid a lot of money for it. I saw it on eBay. And it was only like $20 on eBay. I would have paid a lot more than that. And I snatched it up because... Nobody else wants a little teapot. So, um, I, and I can't tell you where I got it. I, I, yeah, I'm sure I, really I got it as a, one of a kind, but it, it as a birthday one. gift or something. Oh, yeah. But I do want the one that the that one that matters. <laughs> and Matt, how did you procure that out of the sun? I got it from a Hake's auction house about five, six years ago, I think it was. It came from a former employee of the Regal China Company. It's a prototype for the, the one that she showed earlier, that's figural of the Mad Hatter where he's, you know, pouring out of his hand. And mm -hmm. so it's the prototype. Right, yeah, that would be wonderful to get. I have, I, I was telling you all about, to answer some of the other questions. Oops. Uh, that's right, Mark, we had some people who wanted, who requested specific items from both of you. That's right. This is made out of the pages of a book and Mark Richards from England helped me to obtain this. So this whole teapot is made out of pages of an Alice in Wonderland book. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. And thank you, Mark Richards. And this is one of the smallest ones that I have that I count as one of the teapots. And it's a Disney one. <laughs> ah. So, yeah, to answer those questions. And I think um, <clears throat> Stephanie was asking about the, the attraction uh, prints from the attraction that didn't get built. I do have those up if you want to see them. Yeah, if we could take a look at those, that'd be wonderful since they were sure. special request. Yeah. Let's share again here real quick. And Matt, in the meantime, do you have something that you were dying to get that got oh, away? Got away? Uh, <laughs> Someone else snatched it up? Always something that got away. The, <laughs> yeah, the Zaccanini Queen of Hearts. Um, Zaccanini was an Italian company. In, well, they've been around for a long time, but in the 50s, they did Disney figures. They did five. The five accepted figures there's a bunch that are disputed um and anyway there was one that came up a year and a half ago maybe two years ago now on ebay and it was very long and painful story um but i ended up not getting it because he the dealer was 
shady, I guess is the right way to put it. Uh, but uh, anyway, so here's the, um, here's the series of drawings from a Disneyland ride that never got made. It was going to, the Alice ride was originally going to be a walkthrough. And so the uh, designer at Disney uh, called Bruce Bushman created these, these are brown lines. So these are reproductions of his original concept sketches. Um, this one's actually an original drawing. It's the only original drawing I have of his. So from the, you know, the glass table for the drink me bottle, and you can see the little guests down here encountering it in the walkthrough. And there's the actual drawing uh, for the concept of itself. And so there's a whole bunch, I think there's maybe 25 of these um, where you would walk through Wonderland as Alice was going through Wonderland in the movie. And you would sort of have the opportunity to interact with these sort of sets. Um, and here's one that was rendered in full color, hand colored, I should say. Um, the White Rabbit's House would be a slide for the kids. And um, this is the set of wonky stairs in the, in the White Rabbit's House and the flowers and the caterpillar. And, you know, this is like a carnival thing where the tree trunks spin and you have to work your way through them. Um, so yeah, there's a, there was a whole series of these um, created for this walkthrough that never got made. Uh, in the early days of Disneyland, they had several walkthroughs, but you know, by the time the ride was eventually created in 58, they had changed it to a dark ride that ride through the Caterpillar cars. So yeah, that's, those are the, the drawings for that walkthrough that didn't get made. Nice. Yes, thank you for unearthing that. I want to go on that ride. That looks amazing. <laughs> Goodness. And Alan, actually, did you have any answer to my question regarding, like, were you ever outbid on something amazing or is there something you're still looking for? Uh, yes, I'm, well, always looking for stuff. Uh, and yes, I've been outbid and I've been pretty upset. Uh, but the one that got to me the most was uh, an auction I bid on, on the West Coast from an unknown, from a, a not to be mentioned auction house called Profiles in History. <laughs> uh, where I bid during the Debbie Reynolds oh, yeah. uh, auction a few years ago, she was a big collector of W.C. Fields. And so was I. I mean, I, I've been, I was collecting Fields before Carol. I was just interested in fields. And what came up was a bound set of papers. And I spoke to the auction house. I had him go through it. And sure enough, his contract with Paramount for the 1933 film was in there. And so I bid on it based on that one sheet out of 50. <laughs> and I watched the auction and I got it. And it turns out a week later, I still hadn't heard from them. And they said, nope, we never, we never issued, we never executed your bid. And I said, why? <clears throat> and they couldn't give me a good reason. They had it. They just never executed it. And so some guy in New Zealand won it. I spoke to the president of the auction house. I said, I'll offer you what I, what I bid for the 50 just for that one sheet. And he went and talked to the guy and he wouldn't do it. Turns out the guy bought something like 25% of the lots out of, that, out of that Demi Reynolds thing. So I think there was something shady going on. Um, and I'll say it again, <laughs> uh, profiles in history. Uh, I actually opened up a case with the California Attorney General. It didn't go anywhere because their, their contract that I signed was ironclad. They could they could throw away my bid if they if they wanted to. They were completely um, free of any blame. Anyway, I was really pissed for quite a while on that. No hard feelings, I'm sure. <laughs> no. And we have someone in our chat saying they had a similar experience at that very yeah. same place. Yeah, so I, I, don't know. I, I have uh, since uh, met yeah. I I have since met uh, uh, other people who have had a similar a similar experience at that same place. Um, now, Matt and uh, Alan, do, do one of you have something that the other, I mean, I'm sure you have items that the other covets, but one thing in particular that you're just like, ah, I wish I had that. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen his stuff up close and personal, so I don't. Yeah, it's not it. like you know his whole catalog. You, you don't have bought, that in your Palm Pilot. I bought some very nice stuff out of Matt's trunk also. <laughs> just like, uh, just like uh, Ellie said. 
uh, in yeah, hotel rooms at show, hotel rooms at two a.m. Yeah. Things like that. Uh, um, but I don't know. You see, I, I I'm not the Disney expert. I like rare stuff, and you know, if Matt tells me it's rare and I should have it, that's usually when I get it. But I don't think I have something on the top of my mind that's Disney related um, at the moment. Actually, Ellie, do you know what percentage of your teapots are Disney related? Approximately? Not that much, actually. Yeah. Um, probably, yeah, less than 10%. And maybe like 5%. It depends. But no, I mean, there is a lot of um, Disney, but it's not overwhelming. There's, there's more of other things. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I was going to ask, are they just too common, but you're saying they just don't make that many of them for the most part? No, it's interesting. So um, uh, Japan Disney actually makes a lot of teapots. So a lot of the teapots that I've gotten um, that are Disney are from Japan. Um, okay. It probably is about 10% of the collection, but um, yeah. So um, they, they keep coming up with new ones in Japan more than here for some reason right now. Um, I'm not interesting. Sure Disney, you know, Disney's very commercial. They just, whatever they put How out. How dare you, sir? They know they'll sell. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. Well, hey, I buy them. <laughs> so it's, it, I mean, it's like pins, right? I know Matt is <clears throat> off of the pins. He used to be, but okay. But, uh, uh, we made but a I decision. still collect pins. No. But the pins, the pins are, are outrageously priced now. Um, Hang on, what do you think? Oh, hi. So I was going to say, we made a decision about 10 years ago to really focus on 51 and before, unless it's like truly spectacular. I remember. So we have been, at the time, we divested a whole bunch of stuff and we're still doing it as we go through that hell hole that you saw over there. So it was funny. Our daughter was home from, um, <clears throat> from college one summer and, and she wanted to be able to make some money. And for a while, Matt had been buying these pins, right? And it was the the Disney, Disney auction bins, yeah. and yeah, they were, in, they were same. In, um, male bins of pins. Okay, I mean it was just ridiculous, and there was no end in sight. And we just said, you know, this we're not going down this right route. You know, pull out a couple of things that we felt like were special. So we told our daughter that she could sell the pins, you know, at eBay over the summer, and she was like, oh, no, I really, I was, I was hoping to make some money, right? And we're, you know, and I can't remember what the first one was. Oh, it was one. Of, it was a Gomes pin, like the limited edition, like twenty five or something. And it went for like over a hundred dollars, and she was freaking, and she's like, "Oh my gosh!" And so she um, sold pins. She had a, like an assembly line in her bedroom, you know, for the whole summer, and she did, you know, really well. So then she went to Scotland after that, right? I took over, but I took over as her, right? <laughs> you know, just to keep the whole thing going. And I hadn't answered a, a customer once. And she's like, mom, it's so important to respond to customers questions you, right away. You got to keep my reputation going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> well, we have an armoire that is, was custom built uh, in our guest room where it's into the, the closet area. And I like to say all the time that that was 100% paid for with pin money. <laughs> You know, it's oh, like it turned out to be right. quite lucrative and it was something we didn't need to have. So I'm glad we got to roll it over, you know, at the time, the best could, time, possible, the best time yeah. you could make. Yeah. We sold at the right time. Not like <laughs> yeah. these babies, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. Do you, for all three of you, do you sell any, I mean, exactly. I know you're collecting to collect, but do you yeah. ever be like, yeah, I, mean, I don't need this? Or... If you, if you don't sell, you can't yeah, buy. buy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not a dealer. Um, okay. So I don't usually sell my stuff. I'm just collecting. Okay. So. And Alan, I saw you shaking your head vigorously as, now, as well. I have, uh, I have uh, uh, some shelves of duplicates mm. uh, away from this room, down in the basement. Uh, but very rarely do uh, things leave because I don't, well, they should. And I know Allison <laughs> knows that they, they should. And she keeps reminding me. <laughs> uh, but, and we did, you know, in 2012, we opened a little Boojum bookshop up here and uh, hey, a fair number, of, uh, fair number of books went. So. All right. All right. So I would need like another meeting. 
I would like to request that we continue this conversation over on the social hour, which those of you on the email list, you have all the info there. I've put the meeting ID into the chat a few times. I'm about to put the actual link too, so you can just click on it, but I didn't want to do that earlier in case that caused confusion somehow. Uh, so I believe your panelists will all be there so you can ask some questions, but also I can't emphasize this enough. This is for everybody to talk to everybody. This is truly a social hour. So um, please come join us in Tate Park can't talk anymore it's been two hours and 16 minutes into the presentation you're doing yeah. a good job too oh thank you really? i appreciate that i think appreciate my it. the my biggest problem is reading the bios i'm a much better off the cuff <laughs> i stumble over a lot of words in the introductions all right so here did i hit return on the right there we go so there we just it, touched that uh, oh yeah, that works. Good question. <laughs> but again, I, I will go ahead and put the meeting ID just up there again because that's always good. If the if the link doesn't work for Zoom in general, you can always log in manually with a meeting ID. And again, it's in your email. If you joined us via, if you're a member who who got who is on our email list, and yeah, it was so wonderful. To I think Alan already left, <laughs> but Ellie and no, Matt. No, oh, no. you're here. Thank you for being here. So I mean, such an enthusiastic audience here. So many questions. It was wonderful. And we hope to see everybody next month at the spring meeting, April 23rd and 24th. And also uh, just moments from now in our, our next meeting. Thanks. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye.